On behalf of Equestrian Canada, we welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. We hope you will find this webinar most informative and entertaining. For those not familiar with the Zoom features, we ask that you mute your line to avoid any background interference during the session. If you wish to submit a question during the session, please do so using the Q&A feature, which you can find at the bottom of your screen on your toolbar. We ask that you not use the chat for questions as it can be distracting to our presenters. As we have a lot of people joining us this evening, we ask for your patience if we experience any technical difficulties. Without further ado, I turn it over to our presenter, Clive Milkins. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another in the series of para webinars brought to you by Equestrian Canada. Uh, thank you for everyone who's attending tonight, especially as it's a Saturday night um, with you in Canada. Um, I'm actually in the UK and it's just about coming up to 11 o'clock at night. So if I appear a bit jaded and a bit um, of a mess, I apologize about that. I hope tonight that we will answer some of your questions on adapted equipment and also encourage you to develop your own learning for the future. Um, welcome to all the new delegates and welcome back to those who have already shared our journey so far. Thank you to all of you for wanting to expand your own knowledge and spending, this, and spending time with us this Saturday evening. There's an old coach's expression that says, I don't know what it is that you don't know. And therefore, I shall have to tell you everything. Of course, in a one hour session, it's impossible to explain the complete intricacies of adapted equipment, the uses of them, where you buy them, and the competition rules surrounding them. We'll be giving time to questions at the end of the session, as Christine has already said. And of course, if we don't have time to answer your questions, please feel free to email the office and we will respond at a later date. I would also like to add that when you see these, ad these webinars advertised in advance, please feel free to suggest topics that you would like included. At the moment, I'm following my own format when I run paraclinics. I am very happy to diversify and cover the subjects that you'd like explained in a different way. Now, I deliberately call this presentation adapted equipment rather than compensating aids. Compensating aids is the title given in the rule books and it's the term most often used in competition. And because I'm me and that's the standard title, I'm gonna do something different. Because this presentation isn't only about the rules. Yes, rules imply competitions. And therefore for me, there's a good chance that by the time the athlete, coach and parent needs to read the rules, they're already experienced at what equipment their athlete can use. And to be honest, the rules are pretty easy to find on both the FEI and the Equestrian Canada websites. Please ensure that you read the current rule book. It's very easy to rely on social media. And while social media is an amazing tool to connect with friends, colleagues and like-minded people, the only place to verify rules and check hard fact are the rule books of the governing body. And in our case, that's a question in Canada and the FEI. Now, I will add a little bit of a warning here. I am sometimes at fault. Yes, even I have to admit my faults. Because I prefer personally to only work with the FEI rules. And there are two reasons for this. I, for a start, I'm lazy and I work in so many different countries that it's impossible to memorize the individual rules of all the national federations. I don't like giving out erroneous information. And I think, as I've already said, it's very dangerous for a human to give out information that is open to interpretation in a different way by other people. Coaching is about enabling. It's about empowering others, not dictating. Coaches and athletes should really be doing their own research rather than assuming that one lecture has all the answers. 
So as I say, I hope this presentation is the, is the start of your own journey of exploration. The second reason I use the FEI rules as the baseline is that there's a real challenge that if athletes manage to compete successfully at bronze, silver or gold level with one set of rules and equipment, then suddenly you go to an international and change the equipment. If we start with the same rule from the word go, it's much easier to transition to internationals. Now, okay, I know not every athlete is aiming for international competition. One of my failings as a coach, though, is that I, I will always push for more. I will always be aiming for the next level. Let's think big for a change. And yes, I think everybody knows I'm known mainly as a competition coach. And there's no doubt in this presentation, it is aimed at long term towards competition. So we will talk about the rules, but please check them for yourself. I think as well in coaching, we also talk about goal setting. And of course, goal setting is vitally important. There's one more important word though with goal setting, and it's a word we sometimes or often forget. It's a very simple word. It's the word how. How do we achieve our goals? And so this presentation is aimed at athletes and their coaches who are working with riders who want to know what equipment is available to them, how to train with it safely, maybe how to help the horses. And I hope that by the time the riders get to international level, they know where to go to for advice and how to use the equipment. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. As Sue explained in the previous session, classification is designed to help create a level playing field for all athletes. Approved compensating aids, including specialised equipment, are designed to work in the same way. And therefore, there are rules in place to enhance this idea. Each competitor should be using their ability and their skill while riding, regardless of their impairments. So I believe the coach should ask the question, are compensating aids being used by riders to compensate for the physical or sensory limitation resulting from the impairment, therefore enabling them to ride a horse to the best of their capacity? Compensating aids can be used to ensure safety and welfare of the horse and the athletes, such as controlling an athlete's limb that flails. Adapted equipment can also be used to enable an athlete to give clear, understandable aids to the horse. We have to understand in para, the aids that a rider with an impairment can use to signal instructions, because that's what an aid is, it's a signal to instruct the horse to do something. These may not be classically correct aids with a para athlete. However, all aids should be safe. They should be welfare friendly and they should be a, an effective means of communication between the horse and the rider. The coach should always be looking at ways to enable a rider to create correct dressage in a harmonious way. Now, of course, the debate starts when you have to decide how the athlete influences the horse's way of going. Adapted equipment should not be used to compensate for poor riding skills. And I think in some ways, this is why the lower grade athletes have more access to compensating aids than the higher graded athletes. Athletes in the higher grades tend to have more specific adaptions for their individual impairments because their needs are less generalized through the rider's body. Their needs are different. For example, a handhold at the front of the saddle, as you can see in the picture in front of you, would enable somebody with a high level spinal cord injury to balance better in the saddle. It may give them confidence and safety that they can stabilize themselves in the event of emergency. But that same hold should not be allowed to hold an athlete in place. They're there for support and safety, not to stop the rider from learning to balance. All, all equipment must allow the athlete to fall free from the horse. An athlete missing one arm, for example, would only be allowed rein adaptions for that one arm, as this athlete is affected from the one limb rather than the trunk. 
As I say, a compensating aid is not to be used to compensate for a lack of riding skill or as an aid to enhance the horse's performance. This would be considered a training aid. The well-being of the horse is paramount in considering the use of all equipment. Now in training, the coach, and of course ideally the rider, has to decide whether the athlete needs to improve their skills to become effective, or it is the impairment that prevents a rider from completing the riding task. This is where every time the, th the physiotherapist should be engaged for advice, what can be achieved with, better, with, with different training. In competition, once the athlete has been assigned a grade, they are only permitted to use those aids that are approved by the classifiers. These standard aids have already been recognised for that profile number. Any other adaptions must be approved by the FAI Compensating Aids Committee. And any request to have those compensating aids changed for sport must be directed to a recognised classifier. Whilst compensatory aids and adapted equipment are varied, they can also be unique to each para-athlete. They should never provide an advantage to the athlete. They are there to act as compensation for an existing impairment. In competition as well, classification and any, uh, like classification, any adapted equipment must not give an athlete an advantage over the other athletes within that grade. I believe all athletes should be encouraged to, to ride with as few adapted pieces of equipment as possible. For the minute adaption is made, it's one more thing for the coach and the athlete and the horse to get used to. And in my experience, the more knowledgeable and experienced the athlete is, the fewer adaptions they tend to need as they develop skills and knowledge. They develop ability and their experience can often overcome certain limitations of the impairment. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. In coaching terms, if it's safe and it works, then it's right. This is a didactic upon which I have always relied. Of course, there can also be recognised differences between what, what equipment the coach and rider can use in training and what is used in competition. A coach may use, choose to use a certain type of range as a therapy in order to help the athlete develop the feel, correct feel in the contact. But they may choose a legal adapt, a different adaption in competition in order to improve the results. Can't stress enough, adaptions should not be used to compensate for poor riding. A coach's ultimate aim is to help the athlete to be as knowledgeable as they can be, with their body following the horse's movement rhythmically and as symmetrically and as balanced as possible, and of all, as always with harmony with the horse. In other words, to be as classically correct as we can expect. All adaptions should be designed to enhance clear and effective communication between the horse and the rider. In some cases, all we need are commanders, headsets, living letters. Any adaption is there to ensure effective, safe communication between the coach and the athlete. For example, one of the reasons I talk about this is because a client who does not keep their reins short enough, do they have a physical reason for not being able to grip the rein in a short matter? If they have a physical challenge, then great. Loop reins alleviate the problem quickly because they can set the length of rein from the hand to the, mat, the horse's mouth. However, they don't solve the problem of contact. As you'll see in later slides, riders can use loop reins, can still ride with a soft contact, as the contact very often comes from the shoulders and the elbows. But then there are riders who simply just don't grip the reins. Now, loop reins may enable a coach to move on to training topics because we can get and shorten the reins and, and, and crack on with other things. But assuming the athlete has no physical limitations to the strength, or their, that affects their, or, or the range of motion that affects their grip, for those riders that just don't hold the reins tightly, adapted reins would not be allowed in competition. This doesn't mean to say the coach shouldn't choose to use them in training at home. In fact, they may be useful. 
rainbow reins or the colored reins can also be very useful in explaining where the hand position should be. Simply put, the coach and the athlete must know why they are using each piece of equipment and the benefits they want to gain from them, but also any problems further down the coaching system. Another example of why specialized equipment may be used might be that using elastic bands on the stirrups to support the athlete's foot in the correct position or using Velcro to keep the lower limb still. These would be allowed for athletes who have motor skill challenges, weaknesses, who have recognized sensory challenges in their lower limbs, but they wouldn't be allowed for a novice rider who just hasn't learned to keep their legs still yet. When a coach is learning to uh, is starting to develop an athlete with a physical disability, your posh, bespoke, personally made equipment won't be available. Now, most uh, coaches who are used to para sport and therapeutic riding will have a range of reins, Velcro, and other adaptions in their tack room. And most therapy coaches are pretty good at coming up with new ideas for different things. They'll very often have a rummage around the tack room and come, come up with something that is perfectly acceptable. The saddle you see in front of you is clearly not been put together in five minutes. Saddles like this are very, very expensive and very difficult to make. Whereas rain adaptions and, and stirrups are much easier to, deal with, to start with. I also find that sticky tape, Velcro and elastic bands can very easily be adapted in order to be effective. Sometimes at the beginning it doesn't look pretty and there are specialist saddlers who will make the equipment for you but the real key is always to keep things simple and safe. Saddles must always fit the horse even in the riding school situation where they may not be fitted to the rider quite as easily. Velcro should always be strong enough to assist the rider but able to tear away from the horse. Elastic bands should always have an easy breaking point. And they may be able to prevent a, a flail limb from disrupting the balance and the harmony. But also if Velcro is used too tight or strapping is used too tight, it may cause the rider's body to tighten and resist that restriction. So again, caution and physiotherapy advice is always recommended. Any new piece of equipment should be, the training and introduction should be planned properly with all supporting parties and the athletes knowing why the equipment will be safely enhanced performance. Everybody needs to be aware of the plan, that planned progression in order to achieve that performance goal. The coach should always prepare the horse by training the horse in the equipment themselves before the athlete does. This will settle the horse, this will give the horse confidence and it allows the horse to become accustomed to the equipment and can enable the coach to work through any problems with the equipment. My rule is only change one thing at a time. This can be a challenge when you're uh, asking a rider to achieve their goals but you only change the one piece of equipment at a time and maybe the whole session of, uh, is about addressing the equipment issues. And unless there's clearly a safety issue at, or an uncomfortable horse, or the welfare of the horse and or rider is compromised, I always give each new piece of equipment three sessions. I will film it, I will make notes, but I have to have at least three sessions before I bin the idea or start to change, change, change it. This particular saddle in front of you is now not legal. At the time, it was built for a design for a European athlete who had a very high um, spinal cord injury. In fact, it was quite high and he, he could not sit upright without the support that the saddle gave him. He was an ex-international show jumper and he knew the risks he was taking on by riding in the saddle like this. There are two issues with this saddle. The first one is the cantle support at the back and the handhold at the front are both too high, creating much too deep a saddle. And in fact, this rider was wedged into the saddle. It was his own personal choice 
and at the time it was allowed in the rules. But the main reason this saddle wasn't uh, was not allowed, simply the weight of it. The horse struggled to cope. The horses, uh, even big horses, I know how big this horse was. It wasn't a small horse. The horses started to struggle with the weight of this saddle on their backs because when you have a, 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 an athlete with a spinal cord injury, they very often are, they can't move in the saddle. So therefore they become more of a, a, a immovable weight that the horse has to support. And you can see by the extra side saddle balancing strap at the back of this saddle, that the saddle really did need a lot of support. But it's quite a useful one to see where the padding came and, and how it supported his, le his legs. The reins in particular, the, the thing that I also find so interesting is with, with reins, productive results often work well when you take the rider away from the horse to rehearse. If you're an actor or you're doing an exam, you study, you rehearse. With reins, it's a great way of giving the rider exercises to do away from the horse is practice with their sets of reins. I'll often allow athletes to take the reins home with them to practice their grip, to practice their range of movement. You can even put horseshoes or weights on the end of the reins so they start to develop movement in their elbows and their shoulders. And you can even have somebody standing behind the rider to ensure that they use the correct joints. This also has the added advantage that the rider does their homework. I believe very strongly in empowering riders to become as independent and as accountable for their actions as possible. If they take the reins home, they've got to bring them back for the next session. But then they have to remember their riding hats, they have to remember their riding gear, and of course they have to remember the day and time they're riding. So one more piece of equipment adds to their knowledge and it adds to their own accountability. This may sound like a very silly comment, but if you have a horse on lease or you're borrowing a piece of equipment, before you modify it permanently, please check with the owner. Once you start putting holes in leather, the damage or the adaptions may be permanent. So often for me, local saddlers are good sources of older saddles and they may well show an interest in helping for a, a reduction in their costs. They may find an interest to develop the project. As you can see with this saddle, adding, adding um, knee or thigh blocks to the saddle is quite tricky with a leather saddle. With the newer Velcro saddles, and I'll show you one of those in a minute, it's easy to start readjusting where the, where the uh, pads are before you uh, stitch them permanently. Next slide, please, Jamie. I think for me, in competition, I always want the equipment to be smart and functional in order for the athlete to look as able-bodied as possible. So for me here, I would have had dark colored Velcro, sorry, light, uh, dark colored Velcro on dark bridges, light cover, colored Velcro for light bridges. So you're not d revealing the athlete's impairment in quite, quite the same way. Uh, if you look at the rider's feet, uh, they are in a safety stirrup and they also have elastic bands around, around their boots. I think, as I said, for me, the ultimate goal is to use as few pieces of adapted equipment as possible. The more you use, the more complicated life becomes. There are more pieces of equipment to break. Rubber can perish in the heat and the cold. If you don't carry enough spare Vel Vel Velcro and rubber bands, they can break at inappropriate times. The minute you use adapted tack, it becomes expensive to replace and repair. Once a saddle is adapted for a horse, and the, the time it takes to create an adapted saddle for the lower grade riders, very often you've moved on to another horse or the saddle doesn't fit and you then start, start the whole process over again. The more, the more equipment you use, the more 
complicated life becomes. There are also more pieces of equipment to forget to take with you to competitions or to lose or to break. And the more equipment you use, you have to retrain the horse every single time you use something new. Um, with this particular photograph, the Velcro strap across the thigh is incorrect because that would actually hold somebody for competition. That would be a very good stabilizing aid in, in training. But I would be concerned that the amount of Velcro overlap would not come adrift quickly in the case of emergency. Next slide, please, Jamie. So another, I, I, I sort of collect photographs of adapted equipment. I found this saddle um, in uh, in a tap sale in in in, um, in Maine uh, a couple of years ago. Again, it is not legal. The front handhold is too high. It would create too deep a saddle. There's a very good diagram on the FEI website about exactly the size and dimensions of how deep the saddle can be with a supportive cantle and a hard handhold. This is too deep. So what does a rider require in order to ride effectively at their required level and in order to improve? Well, this level may be either to effectively achieve the given task in a coaching session or for competitive purposes. The equipment may be, ne may be needed as an aid to explain new or developing concepts, such as shortening the range or extra balance. Um, a soft handhold may be used for the first experience of trotting. Both examples are short-term aids to develop and demonstrate a new concept, but would not be needed as the equestrian skills develop. So for me, the first thing that a coach has to ask and the rider has to ask is which part of the rider function correctly and which do not. What are the challenges caused by impairments? And what are the challenges that are caused by compensation or lack of knowledge or experience? And this piece of information makes a real difference to coaching. Always listen to the rider. Always listen to their per personal support staff of parent or carer or partner. But also it's so important we take the advice of the medical professionals who are experts in their fields. They will understand both the rider and their impairments and their underlying conditions. What they, what the, what they can do and what they can't do in different situations. The coach should also use their own observation because sometimes riders don't become so used to what they can and can't do in certain situations they forget that in new environments and in new stimulations it can trigger new responses for the for the body i had one athlete who was a, a spinal cord injury she could not put her feet in the stirrup the, the the feeling of metal against her boot caused her legs to go into spasm so she rode without stirrups always ask the athlete which impairment challenges can be improved upon and how so I will start, when I meet a new rider, I will watch them away from the horse. I will talk to them. I will talk to their understanding of perceived balance and function. Now, there's no way I'm a medical professional. So I always take advice from the experts. At the same time, it's pretty easy to work out how much grip somebody has to hold a rein. And you can watch and see their range of movement in the rider's arms. So for adapted reins, I, I check existing ranges of movement in the elbow and the wrist before I look at the strength and grip in the hands. If a rider has a missing arm, clearly a bar rein of some description will be needed from the outset. But if the rider has a shortened upper limb, is it possible to allow the rider to ride the two reins? How could we secure the second rein on the impaired side safely? You'll see videos of this later. I also look at the sitting posture of the rider and their, and their balance. Does the rider sit symmetrically or do they sit unevenly? If they don't, this can be a challenge to both horse welfare and to rider safety. I did once coach a rider who was missing her whole left seat bone and her left buttock. We just put her in a side saddle. There's always ways 
around things you sometimes got to think out of the box and i know therapeutic coaches are fantastic at thinking outside the box can the rider stand and walk either aided or unaided even watching them a few steps will enable you to see whether the pelvis is level whether the, the legs move evenly symmetry and balance are so important and they're important to pay attention to can the rider turn their hips equally in both directions can they turn their shoulders in both directions we're clearly not going to talk about mountain tonight because tonight's about adapted equipment but i always find understanding an athlete off the horse watching how they pick up a pen watching how they drink a cup of coffee watch how they turn to face you gives you an idea of how they're going to ride and then we want, then i'll see the rider on the horse now those of you that know me know that i'm i like work without stirrups so i would always put a rider on the horse for the first few minutes without stirrups even if the horse stands still most novice riders will put their feet in the stirrups and ram their seat to the back of the saddle i like to see the knee and the lower limb hanging down it's much easier to assess the rider's pelvis and the natural asymmetric balance i find if a rider sits without stirrups the pelvis and the thigh falls into its own natural position Often with a good horse, the movement of the horse, so we don't have static balance, we have dynamic balance, the movement of the horse tends to help the rider feel straighter, even if they're unused to the feeling. And that's something else we have to look at, is the difference between genuine lack of balance or perceived lack of balance. If the rider can start to use mirrors or feel when they're asymmetric, then they can often self-correct. I think it's also to remember that if a rider has tight adductor muscles, they may not be able to stretch sufficiently in their upper leg. You have to give them time on the horse to allow the legs to settle and sink into the saddle. Incidentally, there are new stirrup leathers that can be adjusted from the stirrup eye end. I really like these because it, say, it, it enables a coach to adjust the height safely without the coach having to spend time adjusting cold hard buckles at the rider's thigh. Having the buckle down by the rider's ankle eliminates the risk of pinching the rider's skin as well. So if the rider has poor sitting balance then a saddle with either a soft or hard hold may be needed. The handholds are not there to keep the rider on a horse. I can't stress this enough. They are not handlebars. They are to support, their, support the rider and give them confidence and there in case of perceived emergency. They also are there to make sure the rider does not balance on the mouth of the horse. So I will often put reins on the head collar of the horse so the, or, or work the rider without reins in order to get the rider sitting correctly. This, again, the, ne the next part of this presentation um, if you're looking for recognized equipment used in competition, you'll find it on the para dressage page uh, in, on the FEI website. The expression standard compensating aids are the equipment that is automatically allocated to each profile and grade, and they are classed as additional aids or equipment other than standard approved saddlery as outlined in the FEI general regs. Standard compensating aids are classed as those which may be used by athletes across all functional profiles. Even though they're noted on your profile number, please check they are on your master list. So standard compensating aids would include saluting with the head only, sitting or rising trots. Gloves are optional because not everybody can wear gloves. Spurs are optional. Funnily enough, a standard compensating aid allowed are our saddles. You can have a soft handhold, we'll see one later. Um, a deep seated dressage saddle is allowed, as long as it's not like the one in front of us. And then of course you're allowed whips, stirrups, breastplates, split reins on double reins, and also elastic inserts in the reins. Non-standard non -standard compensating aids are those that are required by an individual, but are not necessarily pre-described. 
They may include modifications to standard or profile specific compensating aids or a piece of non-standard equipment custom made for the athletes. These have to be recorded by the classifiers and then noted on the FEI master list. If you, if you need anything specific, it, it is necessary for the athlete to apply through their fa federation for approval of such use. And they will very often ask for photographs or video evidence. Anything you use, please check with someone like myself as a Canadian technical leader, or more importantly, because I do not get things right the whole time, our chief classifier in Canada, Sue Fole, who is on the call tonight, and refer to the current rules. If you need something approved by the FEI, Jamie Ann at the office will help you guide that through. Because the classifier's roles in our relation to the compensating aids are threefold to assist the rider into understanding and to help the technical delegate of the competition and the chief steward to ensure the compensating aids are appropriate and safe for the profile and grade. The other role of the classifier is to, uh, is to work with the officials to make sure they are safe and appropriate. Next slide, please, Jamie. So I find this photograph very interesting. This young lady was born missing both her lower limbs. She has nothing from the seat bone downwards. Her saddle is not adapted in any way. It is an ordinary deep seated dressage saddle. She does have a, hand, a soft hand hold on the front for emergencies. Whoever taught Stinner to ride has taught her, to, taught her to ride by using her back and her seat and for balance. You can see that with this particular rider, actually strapping her on in any way, shape or form would actually be dangerous. It is much easier that she slide, should the horse step sideways or she loses control, that she comes off safely and cleanly. And we can't get away from the fact we have to, uh, health and safety is so important, but riding, sport riding is a risk sport. In Stinner's case, clearly she will ride without stirrups because they have absolutely no use to her whatsoever. This will be put on her master list. Also, once they're on master list, you have to check whether they can be changed from time to time. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. As I've said before, riders are encouraged to be as able as possible and only use aids where necessary. The use of those aids are available for the profile number and will be discussed with individual riders during the classification process. It is the responsibility of the competitor, and it is the competitor, not their coach or their parent, to ensure that all aids have been approved and are documented correctly on their, on their master list. And that depends whether it's safe and for the well-being of, of the horse. In this case, with Barbara, the side saddle is not adapted equipment. It is a perfectly acceptable standard piece of equipment. At a competition, the judge and the chief steward have the right to inspect the aids and declare the aids unsafe for the horse or competitor. As I've said, at no point should the, the competitor be secured or trapped in any way to the saddle of the horse. The competitor must be able to fall free. Velcro must be able to come loose in the case of emergency and hands must be able to let go of the rein or separate from the rider's body. Now that is probably for those of you that don't deal with athletes who have amputations is probably a bit pretty scary thought. But if you have a rider who uses a hook 
and there are some on the circuit, and they use a hook rather than a hand to grip, the arm must be detachable from the rider's body in case the horse gets a little bit excitement, excited and the rider comes off. The arm must allow the rider to fall free from the horse. I would thoroughly recommend that at your first competition, before you even get your rider warming up, take any adapted equipment to the stewards to check that's allowed. Planning like this prevents extra stress and heartache. People in the office, Sue Fole is more than happy to be emailed through Jamie Ann for advice. Send photographs and video evidence of your equipment to check that it's all okay. The last thing you want to do is get to a competition and then be eliminated or the steward's not happy or you say it's okay and the steward say it's not okay to upset the rider's first experience. Perfect planning prevents poor performance. I would also suggest at this stage that when you do a, your first test, take your own copy of the test with you to a competition to ensure the judge has the right test. I've also known athletes in Canada to end up going to a competition and suddenly have to change the arena for a different size because some of the para classes are in 40 by 20 meter arenas. And I certainly know Sue's husband and I have been on more than one occasion rapidly running around rebuilding arenas to accommodate the athletes. Be prepared to do that. Going back to the adapted aids, Velcro and hooks and loop closures can be used to support the legs as you've already seen. They must be able to fall free. And Sue will check at the end of the tonight's meeting, but I'm fairly, you cannot have any more than six square centimeters of Velcro on the whole of the horse. The, whenever you have a Velcro, there must be, there certainly must not be more than a three centimeter overlap. And ideally that overlap is crossed over, not folded, folded neatly. Clearly saddles should all be well fitting, well maintained, and they're suitable for any type of horse and rider. Clearly most riders would prefer to ride in a dressage saddle, but side saddles, general purpose saddles, and western saddles are allowed. I've never seen a complete western saddle in use at international level, and you would have to do something about the, the horn at the front. But there are many features of the Western saddle that lend themselves to be looked at for the para-athletes. When the rider is halting, there must be at least three centimetres from the handhold or the pommel to the trunk of the rider so that they're not wedged in. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. This is a really clever design. I've left the slides in this order for a reason. This saddle has been made for a, a, a rider double above, a double below knee amputee. Um, she also has her horse warmed up for her because she's a grade two at the competitions. Now, one of the problems with warming a horse up for a rider by the coach is either the coach has got to ride in the athlete saddle or bring a second saddle which adds time to the changeover between the, the able-bodied rider getting off and the para-athlete getting on. This saddle solves that. The, the picture on the left hand side, it, that flap is totally made of Velcro. So I could ride in that saddle, warm the horse up, the stirrups attach pretty easily. I can warm that horse up in that saddle, no problem at all. And then very easily, the piece of equipment in the middle is Velcroed onto the saddle. And then as you can see by the third picture, the rider then just slips her uh, stumps into the existing pockets. It works very effectively. It's made from Velcro and it was using an existing Wintech saddle. So, um, which we just glued Velcro on the panel to. It was very, it, it, that's been very, very effective. The other advantage of this saddle is it's pretty light as well. 
And I like the dressage saddles because the buckles are lower and that you don't end up pushing riders legs in front of the saddle in order to get the girth tight. So the depth of the seat when pressed down must be less than 12 centimeters. So if you draw a straight line from the cantle to the pommel and then work out or put a piece of string from the cantle to the pommel and then drop a plumb line down to the deepest part of the saddle. That plumb line must not be any deeper than 12 centimeters. One of the other things that's allowed um, when you're riding are, are seat savers. They are removable attachments to the saddle and they protect the skin of the athletes with impaired sensation. They also are very good for athletes with spinal cord injuries who risk the skin breaking down, riders with poor circulation, such as those with spina bifida and spinal injuries. We should, obviously, they should cha train themselves to check their skin regularly because once you get a skin abrasion, because they have, they've got sensory uh, impairments, it can take months to improve the wound. Interestingly enough, I did once have a rider who, who didn't notice her foot rubbing against the inside of her jogger boot. And she ended up losing two toes on each foot because the foot was rubbing against the boot, rubbing against the stirrup. So check it. So gel pads, seat savers are vitally important and they can be made of many different sets of material, um, leather, lambs wool or synthetic material. They must be on the rider's card. Next slide, please, Jamie. So this is a young lady in on the North American continent. She rides a 13-hand Welsh pony at international level. And there's a lot of there's a lot to like about this saddle. It, it, it is an has an able-bodied uh, adult seat. And the, the saddle flap has just been shortened. I don't know whether you can see on your screens, but she has ordinary stirrups, black stirrups, which are pretty wide at the base, which are perfectly allowable, and they keep a foot in the stirrup. There is one challenge for me with this saddle. Next slide, please. I think you can see from this saddle that from this angle that the, the seat itself is very very good will take the size of a, an adult's pelvis but there for me there are two things that cause concern one is the stirrup leather hanging down that low uh, if you look back on this presentation on youtube later you will see that i airbrushed out the strap when she was riding, but I've deliberately left it in for this photograph. And there's something else here that, that I guess I don't quite understand. The saddle flap is great to cope with this rider's leg. However, the saddle, um, the saddle cloth itself impairs the rider from getting a close count, contact on the ride on, against the horse. And that's just something that, that I think is uh, the white saddle cloth looks very smart and it can have the flag of your country on it, which is great. But I think this white saddle cloth blocks the feeling of the rider's leg against the side of the horse. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. So here we have three different saddles demonstrating uh, different blocks and different Velcro attachments. Um, the top two would be le are, are legal in competition because the depth of the seat is less than 12 centimeters and the knee blocks and the thigh blocks support the rider but don't wedge them into the saddle i wonder without measuring it i think the the, the saddle on the bottom right hand corner would probably be too deep the interesting thing with the handhold on the bottom right hand one is it enables you to put your hands further forward. So maybe not with, uh, not with the rider this was made for, but that may enable you to lighten your seat for the horse to trot. 
and it gives you a way of getting your shoulders forwards. I don't think that one is allowed in competition. Weight of the saddle, as I've said before, is always a consideration when designing a specific saddle for an athlete. These saddles are large and bulky and they add considerable weight to the horse before you place the rider on board. That isn't only a welfare issue for the horse, but as, as we saw with a saddle in slide three, you need a tall horse to do that. There is therefore a risk that the whoever is putting the saddle on and off the horse damages their back in the constant lifting on and off. And we have to take our responsibility towards our grooms, carers very seriously as well. Next slide, please, Jamie. So this is a what we term a hard handhold rather than a grab strap or a, or a monkey strap. Um, this is a very clever design because you can purchase these on the internet. They're not particularly expensive and they can slide in and out of existing saddles and they can be secured quite safely without you having to change your own saddle. There is a challenge with them is that they're not, because of course you're not changing the saddle permanently, they can have a tendency to, to wobble a little bit, which funnily enough will unnerve um, a developing athlete. And you, you can see from the angle of this, it's pitched a little bit forward, which is great because it means the rider can sit back and push the heel of their hands on the hard handhold to sit up. However, that, that pushing back to keep yourself upright puts added pressure on the bar. And I have found a couple of times with ill-fitted bars that they then pitched for, pitched the saddle forward onto the horse's shoulder and blocked the horse's shoulder movement and the horses have got a little bit sore so that's something to be watched for but they're a very useful piece of equipment to have in your uh, tack room for, for new riders next up, slide please jamie Ann. so so again a, another interesting saddle um dr Trebart was born without her lower limbs she's not strapped into that saddle she uses the pocket to slide her, her stumps into. And then the thigh straps just support her thighs to balance with. You will find at any point when Gelly gets on, she literally just plugs herself into that saddle and is not strapped on in any way, shape or form. Plenty of stewards have had a look at the saddle and tried to see if she is held in, but she really isn't. Um, it's the same on the other side as well. The other interesting thing to have a look at with this, with this is um, all the riders in these, video, in these photographs, by the way, have had, I've asked permission and got permission to show these photographs. So uh, I'm not causing offence. Everybody knows that I'm using them and I'm not causing offence by using them. Um, also, most of these photographs are on their personal and professional website pages as well. Um, Gelly also has a challenge with her fingers. So she wears a glove and on the outside of the glove, there is a pocket or a scabbard like for a sword and the whip, she doesn't grip the whip at all. It slides to the outside of the back of her hand. So that's a way of attaching the whip for athletes that don't have sufficient fingers to, to control the whip properly. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. This is a horse that I know very well. He was my top horse. Um, you can see that, that Sophie rides without stirrups. Uh, the reason for this is because it is on her card and she's allowed to do so. It is for many reasons, including that if her leg starts to, uh, she uses her leg to encourage Rio to go forwards. So um, actually strapping her, in, it, strapping her feet into stirrups would mean that she was there forever losing her stirrups or a Grand Prix trained horse like Rio is, the different leg aid would cause him to piaf and passage at inappropriate times. 
so she rides him without stirrups. Although her toes are turned out, there is no way at any point the spurs are rubbing his side. And in fact, one of the really important welfare issues with this is that the horses are checked at the end of every competition and spur rubs are penalised by elimination. So we know this is perfectly safe. Uh, Rio also wears a bonnet. They are perfectly legal in competition and do not need to be on a rider's master list. However, at the end of the competition, they will be taken off the horse. So it's pretty challenging if you have a horse that is a little bit head shy. But they are very useful to block out noise of a large environment. Now, you won't see it from this angle, but Sophie wears, has loop reins. But look at the contact and the straight line between her elbow through to the horse's mouth. She also wears a breastplate. And you can see from this photograph that there are legal supports for the free walk on a long rein um, on the horse's shoulder. And what we did with this breastplate was added uh, elastic insert, so it's an eventing breastplate, and we then fixed it quite tight to support um, Sophie's hands from catching the horse in the mouth. However, this is not performance therapy. This is sport riding. And so if you use it, use the support she was allowed. Next up, slide, please, Jamie. Ann. So this slide um, shows a particular type we have in Europe for magnetic stirrups. The rider has a magnet clipped onto her boot uh, in the insert of her boot, and it wedges into the stirrup, as you can see. The minute this rider's heel turns to the outside, that clip releases, and because the stirrup is only half a stirrup, her leg comes out freely. They really work pretty effectively, uh, keeping the, the rider's leg, lower leg down and still and safe. So many athletes use elastic bands to assist and maintain the position of the foot in the stirrup. Again, we have to make sure that the width and strength of that elastic band will break and come free from the horse. And this is a very good idea for athletes with lower leg problems or ankle control. You can also use enclosed stirrups. They're, they're allowed for riders, Devonshire boots, Anderson stirrups and cage stirrups for athletes that maybe wear footwear without a heel. And for anyone that wears footwear without a heel, they must use these safety stirrups. If anybody uses Western stirrups, they have to be fitted with a Devonshire type boot to prevent the possibility of the foot sliding through the stirrup. Sometimes in coaching situations, the rider may force their foot towards into the toe of the boot, pushing the seat back and the leg forward, rather than stretching their heels down. The feet, and as we've already seen tonight, the feet, if they're present on the rider, should be parallel to the ground. They do not need to have their heels forced down and their toes upwards. Uh, next slide, please, Jamie Ann. The double bridle. <clears throat> of course, there would be a bit of a controversy here to say whether the double bridle is called adapted equipment. Uh, it is perfectly allowed in all five grades. However, at any point, the judge and the chief steward or any member of the grand jury and the chief classifier can object on welfare grounds if they think the double bridle is accidentally being misused. We will not tolerate horse welfare issues. And I would also say that although the double bridle has a place in paradressage, and a lot of athletes use it effectively, you can guarantee that if the horse is in a double bridle and the horse opens his mouth, the judge will very harshly mark it and blame it on the double bridle. So they have to be used pretty sensibly. And the reins, on each, the reins on each side must go to the same side of the competitor's hands. You couldn't for any reason 
uh, in traditional classical riding in the 17th century, riders rode with three reins in one hand and one rein in the, in the other hand. But in, in our case, you can't have the rein crossing over the horse's neck. Next slide, please, Jamie. These are what we talk, call rein connectors. So for athletes with upper limb impairments, the rein connectors can be used instead of two reins. This particular setup would be queried, and note my word, it would be queried by a steward because you could argue that with the shank of the curb bit being this short and the two, the rain connectors being too short, it could form a pelham rather than the refined action of the double bridle. Now this may be why this rider was, was aiming for that setup because this setup would make the action of, the, of everything in the bridle vague but it's not what we're looking for in, in dressage. And I think that would be queried by a steward. Unlike the next slide, please, Jamie. This is a much more preferred setup for the double bridle reins in the one hand. You can see this rider has a loop rein and has an adjustment pretty close to her hand to make sure the loops are the right length. Then there is an adjustment for this horse midway between the rider's hand and the horse's mouth. So this is much more like a typical double bridle. You can also see from this that the rider has a hard hand hold. We'll, let, we'll get a closer look at that in a minute. But I think that there's no way you can see this. This horse is naturally built with a thicker jowl. She's a Frisian cross and is a little bit um, has a thicker jowl, but you can see actually her head is not being pulled into a position. Her pole is the highest point, and the Weymouth is at a very relaxed, the, the curb bit is at a very relaxed angle. Judges will pretty heavily penalise the curb bit being at more than a 45 degree angle. The rain from the bit must be in direct competitive. Direct, com direct contact with a competitor. The reins can be attached to the feet, either through toes or through the stirrups, but they are only allowed when there is no other reins are going to be controlled by the upper body. Uh, you we can use rein guides. They are rein guides are attached to the front of the saddle and they are only allowed for riders with short arms. And by short arms, I mean the hands must come no lower than the nipple line. And the rein guides then would act like a turret on a set of driving harness to keep the reins from flapping around and causing a welfare issue to the horses. And these rings as well cannot fix the horse into a position. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. So we start to look at these reins properly now, and this is a, a pretty standard adaption of, of loop reins. Um, I try to keep these presentations without too much uh, pers personality involved. For me, this particular connection is very easy to change uh, at a windy day at a competition. You can shorten and lengthen the rein pretty easily. However, I think there's a pretty unstable connection between the rider's hand and then the actual leather rein. It's too movable in my opinion. This was particularly used for a rider with a, an above arm amputation and it actually were, it just meant the hand popped out of the reins pretty easily, but it's not ideal in my opinion. Next slide please, Jamie Ann. This is a closer look at the hard handhold and you can see here there is definitely a three centimeter gap between the hard handhold and the rider's trunk. You can see this rider is not holding the handhold, it is there for emergencies because at that point um, riders with a spinal cord injury may well put the heel of their hand to keep, um, on, the, on the bar at the top to keep them sitting upright but at no point can you use the bar to fix your hands and fix the horse's head into a position. The judges and the stewards will pick that up straight away. 
Uh, next slide, please, Jamie Ann. This is a very good set of reins for riders who can and want to adjust their reins. Um, in a way, you could argue that they're the pretty bulky set of reins for the rider. And again, they would add a weight to the horse's mouth. But this rider can shorten and lengthen those reins for things like the stretchy walk. Uh, and it works perfectly well for her. Next slide, Jamie Ann. These are a, a close-up of the reins that I tend to use. You can see that unlike two slides ago, this slide, this loop buckles directly onto the rein and it produces a much more stable and easy contact. I have the inside of these loops rubberized as well. You'll also see on the left-hand picture that there's another buckle pretty close to the horse's mouth. And that's on purpose because on a windy day, you want to make, you might want to make like half a hole adjustment, but you don't really want to let the rider let go of the reins when it takes some time to get the reins back again. If their hands are, are wet through cold and rain um, or, or they're getting a little bit fatigued, it's easy to adjust the reins at the horse's mouth without letting the rider take their hands off the rein. The bottom picture of his elastic inserts, they can have a very valuable use when it comes to riders that maybe have an insecure contact. The elastic can take away some of the flail movement and therefore give the horse a, a more stable contact. However, if able-bodied riders ride in them, you can sometimes get um, not get the feel in the contact you would like. And in my, my experience, you can end up with a harder pull than you would normally like. So they're there, they're a useful piece of equipment, but need to be used with caution. Next slide please, Jamie Ann. So these are my reins then actually on the horse. You can see on the right hand picture, that extra buckle that you can adjust the length of them. And also if you were going to use elasticated reins, you could slip them in if a rider had one flail arm and one uh, able-bodied arm, you could slip a, uh, an elastic insert into the right hand, between the buckle and the horse's mouth. And you can see here where, where my reins attach directly onto the rein and provide a pretty good contact with the horse. And if you think back to the slide we had with, with Rio, you could see Sophie's contact was pretty good, even though uh, her impairment means she can't hold the reins in a classical way. Uh, next slide please Jamie Ann and this is where I find it gets interesting this young man does not have any hands so for me from a coaching point of view every time a coach says keep your hands still I will always ask how because the hands are on the end of the arms and in this young man's case, he cannot grip the reins because he doesn't have fingers. So he has a Velcro around his upper arm, which, should there be a problem, will, will uh, open and he can fall free. But you can see um, this is a Dutch horse. And although there's a little bit of tension in the neck and the mouth is a little bit open, there is a straight line from his elbow through his version of a wrist to the horse's mouth. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. So this is what I was talking about earlier um, with toe reins. Um, Bettina is um, a clinical psychologist in Germany. Uh, she knows her own mind when it comes to riding. She has the reins attached to her toes. They are not attached to the stirrups. So she wears half chaps on her legs, but obviously she only ever wear socks on her feet so that she, or in this case, this is a demonstration, so she's not even got socks on, but you can see she's gripping the reins through her toes. The reins in her teeth will always be looser. I mean, she, the horse is in a double bridle, but the reins in her teeth will be looser and they are only there for an emergency. Not sure I would want to ride with my reins in my teeth, but it's a perfectly legal way of riding for a para-athlete. Uh, next slide, please, Jamie Ann. 
This again just shows you another version of her setup. Next slide, please, Jamie. So this is a sort of a setup we use for the reins um, on a rider's wrists. They are Velcroed and can come off pretty easily. That's just a close up. Next slide, please, Jamie. And again, this is another rider riding in loop reins, and you can see she has the reins around her wrists. There are braking points on all those, um, on, all, on all the contact. And next slide, please, Jamie. And that's just, that's a closer view of how the rein is attached to her wrist. And you can see that the horse is not being pulled into a shape, and Scout is very happy standing there being admired. Um, you can also see that she wears the wider stirrups on her feet. And you can see on the right hand side there is a buckle just where her britches are, which means the stirrups can be adjusted at the ankle end. Next slide, please, Jamie. Um, very brief sl uh, slide of a double breastplate. This is an incredibly valuable piece of equipment in training. You can use the, the one up the horse's neck for learning the rising trots and the one close to the pommel to learn sitting trot. And again, it has an elas elastic insert into it. Um, the, the, the horizontal strap is only there to keep the both breastplates in place. And the, you can see on the one down the horse's shoulder, there's an elastic insert in there so that the horse isn't being uh, strangled at any point. Uh, next slide, please, Jamie. Uh, and again, just another, another version of you can see the buckle on that rein by the horse's mouth. Next slide, please. This is a standard bar rein. Uh, again, I would put adjustments on closer to the horse's mouth. The rider does have to practice using these bars away from the horse. It's used for a one-handed rider. And the idea is that you learn to use your wrist in a very similar way, apparently, to you play the cello, the bow on a cello. Um, next slide, please. This is what I was talking about earlier. You can see here that, that there is a prosthesis hook attached to the rein. Uh, Joe's arm does come off if there's a problem. And you can, again, you can see there is a soft handhold on the front of that saddle. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this young man you'll see from his next photograph is a little bit older than he was there. Uh, this was at his first national championships on a pretty safe horse. You can see there the use of the bar rein and you can see the use of the elastic inserts to protect the horse. You can see that we have not strapped Alex's hand down or in. That's because when we did strap it down, his body didn't like it and the arm actually fought him and put him a lot more asymmetric. Um, as far as whips are concerned, you can use a maximum of two whips and they, can be, they will be measured and they can be 120 centimeters in, uh, in length. Any adaption to the whips has got to be approved by the technical delegate, chief steward, or the president of the grand jury. They are there to compensate for an, a rider who is unable to use their legs effectively, but can only be carried by competitors who are able to use their hand and arm movements. And you can see that this young man is uh, not wearing gloves, but he's correctly attired for a competition. So please look at this photograph and then remember it as we go on to the next slide, please, Jamie Ann. That is him last year. Slightly taller version of the photograph you saw before. So um, again, he's now in stirrups because his legs are so long. Um, but you can see that how he's using the bar with his thumb to turn the horse. Next slide, please, Jamie Ann. So we, we now really talk about other compensating aids. Um, athletes with a neurological condition or, or memory loss may be entitled to have their tests called for them at international competition and gold level. They may also use sign language and therefore radio communication. If, uh, so if radio communication is being used, it is necessary for the steward to be present during the dressage test to make sure that you're only calling the words of the test. 
If the commander is using an earpiece, the steward should also be provided an earpiece to listen in. The commander can leave out phrases and change the written test, providing the stewards see the revised text. Words and phrases can be omitted, but not added. I have mixed opinions on the use of earpieces. They clearly have a valuable part to play, especially in the busy warm up and where the weather is bad. However, in my experience, they can be an added distraction because the batteries are flat or there is interference from another piece of equipment or the earpieces fall out or the coaches forget to adjust them properly when the athlete generally doesn't hear and then uses it as an excuse. Please practice with radio communication before you start. Next slide, please, Jamie. -Ann. As I say, athletes with neurological impairments may have their test called. Applications for the test to be called must be in writing. If the test is to be commanded, the steward should be notified and the steward then stands beside the commander to ensure that only those written words are read out. Text cannot be added. I always suggest that the text, test sheets are laminated and I ensure that each test is checked each year. If I, to make sure I'm commanding the correct test. I don't use paper unless it's laminated because in wet weather it gets soggy and the ink runs. I've also seen people try to call tests from iPads and iPhones. The chances are the batteries will die at the wrong moment. Someone is guaranteed to ring you or the screen goes into lockdown. Trust me, I've made these mistakes. I also like the athletes to supply me with their copy of the test, then I can't be blamed for calling the wrong test. An athlete who is hearing impaired is allowed to have the start of their test signal by the coach in case they can't hear the bell. And for those with a visual impairment to indicate the location of the position of the arena, callers may call the name of the letters. We don't have time tonight to show a demonstration of it, but on YouTube there is a very good demonstration of living letters by Nikki Greenhill from Great Britain. You'll notice here that the letters are on a yellow background. This makes it more visible from a distance and highlights the marker. Very often for me, that's the key rather than the position of the letter. In the UK, each letter will have its own color so that a caller can call from the blue marker turn toward the green marker. At national level, you can also use the words at C track left towards M, but you can't do that at international level. You'll notice here that there is a steward by every single living letter. This is not always possible. So if you ever see me in an arena and I'm not commanding, I'm there for safety, I always look down, I always have my hands in my pockets and I do not stand very close to the arena. I have seen coaches accused of giving hand signals, coughing at strategic times and their lips moving. Yeah, great, they're riding every stride for the rider, but it can look like outside interference. And after an hour and 15 minutes, that's it. I'm sure I've missed out um, a lot of the theories behind adaptive equipment. And um, to get it in on time, I've probably been talking too fast. But I hope I've given you a place to start in order to look at adaptive equipment. The real key is always to have the welfare of the horse, the safety for everyone, and the empowerment for the rider to achieve. If you, go, if you start with those ethics, you won't go too far wrong. Next slide, Jamie. And again, the next slide, please. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Clive, for your expertise and insights into the world of adaptive equipment. I find we often see these para-athletes who are riding at international level and it's so hard to see the equipment um, and they're using it so well, I can't tell always what, what they're using. So I found it very helpful to understand what to consider and how to introduce adaptive equipment and how to change the adaptive equipment as the rider's skill progresses. We do have a few questions and we'll start with a question from Anne. And her question is, 
what is the whip length for a pony? Legally, there isn't any difference. Legally, it's, the legal length would be 120 centimeters because we don't actually have that many ponies at international level. Uh, so as long as your whip doesn't ex, um, exceed 120 centimeters, you can have whatever length you think is appropriate. Thank you, Clive. And I'll add that in Canada, in section E, our dressage, paradressage rules, the length of a whip for a pony would be 100 centimeters in Canada. Okay. Um, and so we have a question from Holly. Where can I purchase the removable bar that you had pictured? I cannot find something similar when I have looked. Look on Mary Longdon's website. All right. Is that and Mary, Mary designed those bars and they are very, they are very, very effective. So if they are anywhere in existence, they will be on Mary, on Mary Longdon's web website. Thank you. And I have a question from Bella. I have a lot of spasticity in my legs when I trot and my legs shoot forward and they, they kind of push against the stirrups. What adaptive equipment might help me? <laughs> um, okay, I'll be controversial. I would try without stirrups for a start because then you've got nothing to push against. And then you start to balance with your upper, upper lower leg and your and your seat rather than bracing against it would be what would be my third but you have to make sure you have a, a very safe steady horse to trot like that i very rarely teach rising trot as well and um i, I find that teaching riders to learn to balance in sitting trot is a lot easier but if you're bracing against your stirrup i might even look at um putting velcro around the girth and, and not tightly, but securing the stirrup against the girth so you cannot push your legs forwards, if they, especially if there was a, a toe cap or enclosed stirrup involved in that. Very good, thank you. Um, and we have a question from Elfie. I find elastic bands on my stirrups break too readily. Can I yeah. use can I use Vetrap? Because Vetrap's sturdier or stronger. Yes, I mean Sue, you'll know this answer. Um, no, because it doesn't break. And, th and, and, and that that's the problem. Um, I, I can see why you would want to use um, Vetrap. Actually, if you you can double up your elastic bands and you can use thicker. Uh, parcel type elastic bands, but I don't think Velcro would break in an emergency. A Vetrap would break in an emergency. And Clive, I do concur again uh, with our Canadian rules uh, in section E, it does clearly state elastic bands are to be used. Yeah. So no, no other product. We're only looking for elastic bands. And then I have a question from Bailey, um, I am a coach and I don't understand when an elastic insert in the rein would be used. Could you expand? Yes, very easily. I, would, I use elastic inserts. Should a rider have um, a, a flail hand or a hand that is not particularly controllable and you want to stabilize the hand and, and this is a hand that is not stabilized because of the impairment, not because of a lack of experience. So if you have a hand that wobbles in an uncoordinated manner and you want to protect the horse's mouth, the elastic takes away some of the movement and that's when I would use it. It's not an exciting, but it, it's still, it can be useful if the rider has involuntary movement. Thank you. We have a question from Jennifer. The pictures of the adapted saddles have me wondering how the riders mount and dismount. 
would this be an appropriate topic for another session? Yes, it would, because we, because what we would do, yes, I, it is, they are very, very, that's a very good question. And that was why in my presentation, I very quickly skirted over mounting, because I think that's a webinar in, it, in itself. Um, with those particular saddles, the rider gets on, the rider is lifted on at competitions by her partner. That is a decision that they work together. Uh, it's not a system I recommend because I've got to protect the carers as well. But they lift the rider on uh, in a, it, the, those of you that, that know about saddle, side saddles, um, the rider gets on in a, in a very traditional ladylike side saddle way. So she's lifted up high and then moves across the saddle. But we, we could do a webinar on that at some point in the future. Well, thank you. Um, and I don't have any further questions here. Great. Um, yeah. In that case, as I say, if there are any other queries after tonight, you can find me on Facebook or you can email the office and Jamie Ann will ensure that I get any, any queries. And of course, Sue is, uh, as you can see, Sue and I work very, very closely together. And very often I already find that we, we're thinking, we, we're saying what the other person is thinking. So feel free to contact the office and Jamie Ann will send you a letter, your um, comments to either of us. And please let's have some, let's give me, give us some feedback on what you'd like for the future. Um, because I don't know what it is that you don't know. And I'm very happy to write any presentation that you would like if there's enough interest in it. So please contact us. Um, and all I've got left to say is thank you very much for, for listening tonight. Thank you, Clive. Can I get to bed now, please? <laughs>